thus far in my getting to know this next speaker, I'm convinced that she's an amazing combination of like Indiana Jones, Lara Croft, and Captain Planet, and many other things. Uh, so please welcome to the Skepticon stage, Mika McKinnon. All right, hello, I'm oh, just gonna adjust my mic a bit there. All right, so we're gonna do a practical guide to pre-apocalyptic party planning because we are in an era of looming doom and I would like us all to survive. This is my basic premise is everything's going to hell and there's a lot of natural catastrophes, there's a lot of human generated catastrophes, there's just a lot of stuff that is not going so well. And one of the easiest ways to up your odds of survival are to throw house parties. It is, I'm actually, it's legitimately serious. I really do mean that. So a little bit about me. I am a disaster researcher, a sci-fi scientist, and a science writer. I am effectively a freelance scientist, which I swear is a real job. <laughs> and once upon a time, I got a master in disaster, which gives me like the best, to, like, degree title ever, actually seriously a real thing. Uh, because this has been a kind of rough like, season for disasters, in British Columbia, where I'm from, we had the worst wildfires in our entire history. And then we had hurricane, hurricane, nuclear tests, which as a geophysicist in disasters, I got to spend some time with. Uh, hurricane, more fires, just a whole, uh, earthquakes, I forgot the earthquakes. Um, earthquake lightning, even more fun. So all sorts of horrible things that I don't know what your level of exposure and trauma was, so we're not gonna do any real life examples. We're keeping it to fiction here. All right, we're just gonna, all our disaster motivation is going to be in terrible, terrible disaster movies. Um, you can tweet, take photos, do live streams, whatever, I don't care. I consent to spreading this information however you would like, thus more people will live which is, again, our overall objective. Now, it's gonna be really boring if I stand up here for an hour talking all by myself, so I'm gonna make you do the work. To start with, find some friends nearby. If you don't have friends nearby, make new friends. Introduce yourself, say hello. Don't worry, this is actually part of the resilience we've got going on. Talk about what disasters threaten you? What happens where you live? What type of disasters do you have? Yeah? Just, yeah? They could be natural disasters. They could be more rare. They could happen every year. If you've moved, how are the disasters different now than the disasters where you grew up? All right, let's see, what sort of disasters? What sort of disasters do we get physically here? I'm hearing a bunch of tornadoes, floods, Ice storms, ooh, that's exciting. Ooh, you could get nasty earthquakes here. You've got like a relic fault zone, so you're completely unprepared for them like in terms of your structure, but you could actually have them. Oh, that's not fun at all. What else? How about fires? We got fires, how about air quality issues? Do you have a lot of industry around here? Or any specific localized jobs, say, I don't know, hanging out in coal mines. Those ones are really fun for air quality. Let's talk a little bit bigger scale. What happens if we get a really nasty geomagnetic storm? You guys are pretty far north here. You can knock out the entire electrical grid. We had that happen in Quebec in the 80s, took down the entire grid. Whoops. Uh, we also had a solar flare come just past the Earth, like it just barely missed us, a solar flare that uh, created a coronal mass injection, which is like highly charged particles flying through space. Nice thing is we get a little bit of warning before they show up. It takes some time. They're not the speed of light. They're slower, thankfully. But when they get here on like a good day, we just get beautiful aurora. On a bad day, we completely charge chunks of the atmosphere and knock out the electrical grid, or if we want to go somewhere in between, we just make ham radio really difficult. Why do we care about ham radio? 
Well, that's kind of pretty much the only communication we got out of Puerto Rico for a while. Ham radio is still useful. All right, I'm from the West Coast. I'm from um, either California or Vancouver, depending who I'm talking to. <laughs> it's uh, an expert is anyone from 200 miles away, so I'm always an expert. Pro tip. Make sure you're always from somewhere else. So that's where the hybrid accent is coming from. You're going to hear it come in the, I'm going to leave the house and go out and about now, eh? But you're also going to get the and, and, and bananas. It's good. <laughs> so I'm from the West Coast, uh, where in California, we get the earthquakes, the big one, right? I was in San Francisco during 89, Loma Prieta, the first televised earthquake. Uh, <laughs> good times, sat up on the hillsides watching San Francisco burn. Oh, that didn't warp me as a small child at all. Not a chance, but then I, I, I returned to the Pacific Northwest, my home and true, true love, and uh, that's where we get the really big ones. That's where we get like the Cascadia Zone subduction earthquakes, the ones that were in the New Yorker, where they wrote this big long article that underestimated how terrible it would be. <sighs> yeah, we get mags eights and nines there, and the Cascadia subduction zone has this funny little quirk. Um, unlike most places, so we have an earthquake, it releases a stress, and everything calms down for a little while. But when that stress releases, it actually increases the stress on the other sides of the fault line, the bits that didn't move. And in most places, that just means you're more likely to have an earthquake there eventually. In the Cascadia subduction zone, occasionally it just unzips and just goes, oh, from Alaska to Northern California, it's just going to all have magnitude 8 and 9 earthquakes in rapid succession. <laughs> Whoopsies, let's not do that. That's when you like, start looking at the movie 2012 and being like, oh, I think you underestimated. Uh, so I think a lot about earthquakes, but it sounds like here tornadoes are the big one. Uh, but everywhere, everywhere gets fires and floods. Uh, also landslides. Landslides are actually what I did my thesis work on. It's really, really big landslides coming to kill us all. They act really funny. I'm currently doing some work on landslides in space because, you know, why not? Add on the doom. Uh, so. How can you learn more about your local disasters? How can you find out what the risk is, what the impact is, what disasters you might not have thought about? Talk to each other. Come up with ideas. Where do you find out more about what your local disasters are? <laughs> Gossip with each other. I'm telling you, you have to talk to your neighbors. Believe me, if you start talking to your neighbors now, by the end of this session, you will actually have upped your odds of survival. So I know it's awkward, but just be like, hi, my name is Mika. I want to live. Let's chat. All right. Where are some places you can learn about local disasters? Anyone in this section have anything for me? Where can you learn? National Weather Service. Oh, they're a good one. They've been defunded recently. That's unfortunate. Um, but they are a really, really good one for learning about all the ways the sky is trying to kill you. All right. What are other places? This section? Somebody in this section give me some places you can learn more. Space weather, yeah, that's a subset of the National Weather Service. There's a space weather service that'll let you know when you've got like incoming solar storms and it will give you the prediction on whether or not you'll get aurora, the pretty part, or you'll have interference on radio or uh, really severe interference, which again, let's, let's let hope we don't do that because we haven't hardened our electrical grid yet. It only cost a few tens of millions of dollars, but we'd rather have Super Bowl commercials. So we haven't bothered hardening the grid. Um, anybody else in this section have another one for me? Yeah, all right, so FEMA. FEMA is a beautiful way to learn about your local hazards and how to deal with them. Uh, so FEMA's actually, it's got a bunch of apps now that are really good because it'll also help you document damage. So since you live in a tornado area, you really, if you have a smartphone, you want the FEMA app because then you can take photos before and afterwards. Ah, all right, and here we've got, I'm being told, the StormAware is a, a Missouri-specific app. It's stormaware.mo.gov. 
Looks like it is going to be about weather and tornadoes and storms. So there we go. We've got one that just inside the Skepticon family here. How about over here? Who's got some for me over here? The local historical society. Oh, that's a good one because you can track what sort of events have happened in the past. So. Uh, we have a really funny quirk as human beings in that whatever we grew up with is normal, and then we occasionally shift our baselines to whatever happened last year is normal, depending how aware we're feeling. Um, so those can both be normal simultaneously because cognitive dissonance, and we're good at that too. Um, but that does mean anything that happens infrequently, say once every few generations, we forget about. So looking at your historical records is a great one. I also heard someone over here say emergency management agencies. Yeah, so emergency management is deeply, deeply underfunded.、Uh, so if you're lucky enough to have an actual full-time emergency manager, they have all sorts of resources,、um, and there's been a fairly big push for either、uh, community, community emergency response training or neighborhood emergency response training. So CERT and NERP. Because they're really great acronyms there, and they will actually teach you not only what your disasters are, but how to respond and how to be a better volunteer when things actually go seriously wrong. How about over on this side? Yeah. Oh yeah, add schools. So this is the tactic of every educator in the world: is if we get them young and recruit the small kids, we can nag the parents into submission. So, emergency response totally takes advantage of this, and this is why I ask the question about how are the disasters where you are now different than where you grew up. This is a, something there hasn't been a lot of research on, but we're generally more comfortable with the disasters we grew up with. So I grew up on the West Coast. I'm like earthquakes, no big deal. I can handle this. Fires, floods, landslides—these are all inside the realm of things I've been trained how to respond to since I was like knee high. But you put me somewhere with blizzards. Or hurricanes, or tornadoes. What is the sky is not allowed to do these things. It needs to stay put. What do you mean you have a countdown to doom? Like, how do you not stress out from that? It is not inside my comfort zone.、Uh, but yeah, so little kids are a really great way because we teach them in school and we make them do drills in school about what sort of disasters to expect. And、then you had your hand up over there. Yeah, so universities, you're going to get a lot of,、um, particularly in geology departments, we have natural disasters classes.、Um, the University of British Columbia, where I work, our natural disasters course is the、uh, largest class. It is the largest classroom, so you have like 500 students per class. You teach 3,000 students on campus per year, and another 3,000 distant. So yeah, that's nothing quite like mass mass education on that one.、Um, massive open online courses are another one if you want to try and figure it out. It might not teach you about your local disasters specifically, but it's a really really good one. Yeah. So it's also being said the state level emergency management program. So we've talked about city level, community level, state level, and federal level will all help you out in different sorts of ways. One I haven't heard yet is geological surveys. So、uh, the USGS and your state geological surveys will have a lot of information about your particular disasters.、Uh, they also have a lot of.、Um, Posting as to what sort of monitoring we're doing. So, like the USGS earthquake site has live feed of earthquakes from around the world as they're happening, which is a pretty incredible thing to look at. And you start realizing, oh my God, earthquakes are happening all the time. <laughs> There's like an earthquake every few minutes,、uh, but most of them are really small, so it's okay. All right, other places we want to talk about, yeah. Yeah, did you feel that as the earthquake reporting of the USGS? So if you ever do experience an earthquake, you can report it.、Uh, there's less popular versions of "Did you see that?" where we have our landslide reporting. Nobody uses it. It makes me kind of sad because it'd be a really great data set for me. So you know, if you find any landslides, I wouldn't mind if you felt filled that out just as a personal favor. <laughs> Nobody loves it.、Um, it's like landslides are the least popular of all disasters. <laughs> It's, so your odds of death by landslide are one in a million per year,、uh, but your odds of death by most things in natural catastrophes are one in a million per year because that's how we engineer your safety. We say we're going to mitigate this until those are your odds.、Uh, there are a couple exceptions. Things like your odds of death by landslide in Hong Kong are one in ten million per year, and in Philippines is one in a hundred thousand because of how much money they're spending.
Like, that's it. It's, it's a choice of we have decided it is worthwhile that one in a million is good enough. So, odds of death, one in a million per year for landslides, and we don't really care about them because they're not the really exotic and attractive landslides that get all the attention, or uh, disasters that get all the attention. Volcanoes are way, way more popular. All right, next up. How are you currently personally prepared for a disaster? Chat with each other. Go on, talk about it. All right, I gotta do a quick hand check. Put your hands up if your answer is, I am not prepared for disasters. All right, so this room feels highly unprepared. Let's see if we're gonna change that in a minute. Some people shout at you, tell me your ideas for how you are prepared. What sort of things have you already done? Hmm. Yeah, so we've got a safe space. They've located a safe space inside their place where they can go for tornadoes. All right, I know what I'm supposed to put in my emergency kit, I just haven't done it yet. So that's, hey, that's awareness, okay? What do we have over here, go ahead. Insurance. Have insurance, either renter's insurance, homeowner's insurance, car insurance, some type of insurance. Yeah? So we've got three days of water. Woo, you are highly prepared compared to everyone else we've talked to so far. You've gotten like actual physical items together. So 72 hour water supply, drinking and hygiene, both important, yeah? An AC power generator or backup batteries that are charged or external batteries that are charged. How many people here have an external battery in case their cell phone runs dry? Yeah, yeah, you've got a little bit more preparedness than you thought you did. All right. <laughs> Anyone else in this section have something for me? Yeah? All right, us camping gear and they know where it is and how to use it. All right, so a full 72-hour kit, so not just what's in the kit, but has the food, the water, the, the clothes, the flashlights, any of that sort of stuff. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Stop, drop, and roll. Know how to stop, drop, and roll in case of a fire. Instructions on what to do if on fire, or hey, if somebody else is on fire, smothering them or telling them are on fire. It's kind of surprisingly amazing how easy it is to be on fire and not notice. So, particularly if you do something like fire poi, any sort of thing like that, have a code word that isn't fire to tell them they're on fire, because everyone else is always going, oh, fire! And I'm like, did I light my hair on fire? No, I didn't light my hair on fire, okay. Yeah. All right, so medical supplies and medications, a little bit of their prescriptions in advance that are not expired. Really, that last bit is key, yeah. Ooh, pets. All right, I'm totally, I forgot to bring you a photo of my little hedgehog. Um, but does your pet have an emergency kit? So having a carrier with blankets already in it. I'm going to talk about pet kits more in a second. Yeah? My team can get 850 kids out of a building in five Ooh, practicing evacuation drills. So this is the team has practiced getting 800 kids out of the building in under five minutes. <laughs> Uh, so, by the way, I forgot to do this at the beginning of the talk, in case an emergency strikes while we're in here, your emergency exits are there, there, and there, uh, lit up by the red signs, which indicate it is not a direct exit to the outdoors, so you would have to continue on all the way to the outdoors, which is down the hall to the left is the nearest, if that is blocked, it's down the hall to the right. Know where your exits are. All right, yeah? Having a flashlight with batteries or capacity to charge it or a winder or anything like that. 
Anyone in this section have one for me? Candles, other light sources, anything like that. Yeah? Transistor radio or any sort of radio that you can... A car radio and keys with fuel in your car. Also, that car can work as a charging station. Car is actually amazing for giving you a bit of a couple hours. Hmm? So vehicle survival kits, what if you get stuck, particularly if you have ice storms? Like, it doesn't take much to get trapped for a while, yeah? Gas in the car already, not running it on empty all the time. That is one of those places. So I'm going to take a quick moment to do an aside. A lot of these things require having materials already on hand that are not being actively used. That is a mark of having enough wealth to prepare, that you are not living right at the poverty line where you are having to put gas in your car $5 at a time. It is possible to prepare for disasters to some extent when you don't have much money, but it grows increasingly difficult. This is one of those places where money is almost directly correlated to likelihood of survival because you can do things like live in areas that are less hazardous, leave town when things are crappy, have enough materials and supplies on hand to be able to take care of yourself. So that's one of those things to be aware of, particularly after big disasters where people in the news start doing like the 2020 retrospect, why didn't they just leave? Well, because being able to leave is a mark of privilege. You can't necessarily afford to go off work for three days. You can't necessarily have anywhere to go. So keep that in mind. Have empathy and compassion that people are making the choices they think are best in order to survive. Nobody's going like, hey, I want to die today when they make their disaster choices. All right, other ideas? Yeah? <laughs> uh, so ways to deal with your zombie survival plan uh, definitely is actually kind of applicable in some very weird ways, but if we're going to have a true apocalypse, then we're talking the 10-year survival instead of the one-week survival, in which case, forget your doctors, protect your vets. Doctors need a whole bunch of equipment in order to be able to do long-term health care. Vets are very good at using very low-tech solutions. So, you know, keep your veterinarians, veterinarians alive. Yep. So water purification systems, which can be with camping gear or could be with water storage. Yeah? Pocket knives or any other tools? All right, so now we've talked about some of these concepts. Who said they were not at all prepared? All right, revising that question. Who still feels like they are not at all prepared for a disaster? You have no idea where to go, what to do, what you should pack, or what your disasters are you're more prepared than you thought you were. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit more now about other things that are like in the basic pets, like in the basic um, survival kits. So we talked a little bit about pets. How many people have a pet? Do you have a photo of you with your pet? Take a photo of you with your pet, keep it in your emergency kit. It is the number one way to establish ownership if we manage to get you and your pet separated. So uh, my little hedgehog has his own emergency kit. He travels with it every time we have a fire alarm in our building. He picks up and we both go. I have my grab and go bag. He has his carrier case with a little survival bag in the back. We've got some fabric that smells nice and familiar to him so he's less stressed out. Water bowl, food bowl, spare can of food, uh, some tweezers, some antibiotics, um, a photo of him and me together. A uh, little heat supply because he's a hedgehog and Canada is cold. He's from Africa. He's like, no, this is not okay. Um, it's not enough for him to be comfortable, but it's enough to keep him alive for a little bit. Um, so make sure you do include your pets in your emergency plans. They don't have opposable thumbs. They don't have very good future planning. They are your responsibility to take care of there. So one thing that hasn't been talked about at all is about getting to know your neighbors and getting to know other people who can help you out. Surviving doesn't do you much good if you're all by yourself, because none of us can survive forever alone. Oh, so we just did the how, what else could you do to prepare? So sorry, I skipped ahead one slide there. All right, so we talked about how you actually are prepared. I started getting us going on what other things you can do to prepare. What other things you could do that are either extreme big, huge ideas or just even little small things? Like keep your batteries charged. Have fuel in your car if you've got a car. Have actual physical maps and money, even just a little bit.
All right, so it's, uh, can you prepare the space around your house? So in terms of fires, this means clear the clutter away. In terms of floods, it means making sure that you've got some sort of physical raised barrier or that you've gotten, like, directed the water flow on your property. In tornadoes, it's going to, again, be decluttering and securing loose objects, any of those sorts of things. So prepping the trees, make sure you don't have like loose rotten branches or anything that's going to take out your house or your, uh, your property. Uh, yeah. So stocking up non-perishable food products, kind of having a stockpile, you need to remember to rotate through it. Uh, doing this at daylight savings time is actually a great time to just be like, and I'm moving all my water being used and putting new stuff in. I am changing my smoke alarm batteries. I am doing whatever it is that you need to do. Uh, also, testing your emergency kit is really handy. So I said that every fire alarm, I take my grab-and-go bag and my hedgehog and his grab-and-go bag, and we leave. So what's a grab-and-go bag? Grab-and-go bag is what you need in order to survive the first like 12 to 24 hours. That is, my house burned down, but the city as a whole is okay. It is the, the short-term small catastrophes that can take out a family, but not an entire community. So anything that's that level of disruption, you, you grab whatever it is you need to take care of the next 24 hours. That's like ID, uh, some cash, a jacket, warm socks, like, I am sorry, but I am not, I'm not a human being. If I have cold, wet feet, I am crabby beyond belief. Uh, toilet paper is one of my other, like, basic, I need to have this, or I am going to destroy everybody in my path. And I have a chocolate bar as well, because if I'm not stressed out, I want some happiness. I have a chocolate bar and, like, one of my favorite books. So just, like, a couple comfort items in my grab-and-go bag. Uh, some prescriptions, backup glasses, anything you need to get through that first 24 hours. The other type of survival kit is the stay and survive bag, uh, or kit, or large trash can, or whatever else, and it's the large collection of things you need to deal with the 72 hours. So that's your big water supply you are not carrying, unless you've got a hell of a lot more strength than I do. Um, and it could actually be distributed around your house. It could be that camping gear in the back of the closet. It could be that you've got non-perishable food items that you can prepare with no power inside your cupboards. It's anything that you need to get through 72 hours until the official emergency response and uh, recovery teams start coming in. It takes a while for big places to get organized. All right, other ideas for, for preparedness? Yeah. Yeah, so it's, if you have a vehicle, because it's kind of like your traveling locker, um, or hey, a locker or your desk at school, anything like that, uh, having a kit inside your car of what do I need to be able to kind of survive with? Again, you guys live somewhere freaking cold in the winter. What do you need if you like run out of gas on the side of the highway or the storm is too bad to keep driving? Not just what do you need to survive, but what do you need to survive and be less angry at the universe? Like, that mental health component is actually a pretty big deal. Having a couple of things you think about now will save you so much stress later. It's one of our rules of thumb is every minute spent in preparedness will save you 10 minutes of stress later. Every dollar spent in preparedness saves you $10 in recovery. It's the one to tens. I personally kind of figure it's more like 10 minutes on, on prep will save me like two hours of stress later, just in terms of how I personally react to being caught unaware and with wet, cold feet. All right, anyone else have ideas? Yeah? So if you don't have a car, or even if you do have one, having an understanding of alternate transportation plans, that could be having a bicycle, that could be knowing your public transit routes. I don't know how good your bus system is here, but in Vancouver, we have an amazing public transit system. Uh, or having friends and family that you've talked to before that are willing to come get you, that you've kind of set up and talked about these things a bit. Yeah? So learning how to drive manual, so you've got a greater variety of cars, particularly important in the zombie apocalypse when you're just going to go and take whatever car you can find. All right, I was waiting for this. Have a plan. 
have any sort of plan. So this particular component was the communication plan. So in terms of a disaster, it's going to impact your local community most, which means you have an out-of-area contact, where instead of you trying to call every person who's concerned about you, you all call Aunt Jemima, and she will tell you, yeah, Mika's revived, she's fine. Or your immediate family, where are you going to meet up if your house is not OK? All right, we're going to get into the party planning part of things, though. Because, you know, here's my next question for you. How are we getting to know your neighbors help your preparedness? Why does knowing your neighbors mean you're more likely to survive? Chat amongst yourselves first. All right, let's start over here this time. Why would getting to know your neighbors be helpful for surviving the apocalypse? Sharing resources. Yeah, because nobody's going to have everything, OK? So more organization that you've probably talked at some point and kind of developed more of a plan. Diverse skill sets. Everybody's good at something. Everyone's bad at something. Nobody can do everything. Being able to spread that out helps. Uh, so kids, kids are a really interesting one in this. So this is if the kids get separated, then you can help each other look for them. This is also if um, you work far from the school and something happens, you've got somewhere, someone nearby who can help pick up your kids. In uh, Vancouver, we're a city of a lot of water and really big earthquakes. It could take down our bridges. So if you live in North Vancouver, you have to designate somebody who lives within three blocks who can pick up your kid if there's an earthquake because otherwise the parents could be trapped downtown for days. So having somebody nearby who can help take care of things. How about over here? Other reasons it's useful to know your neighbors? Yeah, so having somebody else to get power from, we've seen this a lot during big storms, like in New York, uh, during Sandy, people would run extension cords out of their house with a little power adapter and people would come by and charge their cell phones. Having someone who's willing to check up on you. Having someone who's willing to check up on you. So, this is a really, really, really important one. If, uh, particularly if there is any reason you are not completely at the peak of your physical ability. 
So if you're young, if you're elderly, if you have any sort of physical limitation, if you're on medications that are, that are making it so you're not necessarily as aware of your environment, any of these things can make it so you don't notice you have a problem or you're not able to respond as well. Uh, during the 2011 uh, earthquake and tsunami in Japan, the vast majority of the elderly who survived, survived because of their neighbors taking them out. Like, it was something like 90% of the elderly who survived was because one of their neighbors was like, you're coming with me, Granny, and took them with them. Yeah. So teamwork and allocating jobs. I like this. I'm going to give you one more really, really important reason. You know how we said it takes about 72 hours for the organized response to come into play? That first 72 hours, your first responders are all your neighbors. It's the people who live there. So I think about this in terms of earthquakes. If there's an earthquake and the building collapses into rubble, the first people who are going to start digging you out are your neighbors. And they're only going to do that if they know that you're missing. Right? If they don't even know you exist, they're not going to come looking for you. In this context, if there's a tornado, the first responders are going to be the people in the houses nearby who did not get hit. They're going to be the first ones out trying to get you. If you have a fire, it's going to be the first ones who are like, there are six people in that building and I only see four on the street. Firefighters, go forth and find them. Right? Like, you need to know who your neighbors are in order to be able to help them. This shows up in a lot of different contexts where the, the more you know your neighbors, the greater your community resilience is. And community resilience is both the immediate survival and the response and the long-term survival of the community. So how quickly does your community respond and recover? We can see an example of this right now in Houston, in that we had a widespread community response to go to different neighborhoods and help clean things up, and then big community bonding over um, the hat that fell down and then got passed back up was a moment of like community victory of we are all in this together. Of that, it was a symbolic bonding moment that was almost a declaration of victory and of overcoming a loss. That, yes, they couldn't stop a storm, but they can fix things where they can. Um, New York is a city that is very, very well known for being hostile to everybody. It's a giant city and we don't care about you and we'll push you into traffic because you're walking too slow. But see how they respond to mass tragedy. That in the wake of 9-11, it was everybody was helping everybody else that it was people opening up their homes. It was people who were donating so many materials and goods that it was like piles of stuff left. That during Hurricane Sandy, it was the power outlets being run down. That there was the boats, the emergent response of everyone who had a boat was going and trying to evacuate people off the island. That these things are not organized in advance. They're spontaneous responses to disaster that are an indicator of your community resilience. And it is the core reason why a community will either survive or be abandoned after a disaster. This even comes into play on an economic basis. So if you have, for example, something that comes through and disrupts your local economy, so you disrupt the entire local region, the sooner you can get businesses back and running again, the sooner you've got a community that moves from immediate response into long-term recovery. If a business can get open inside those first three months, it's probably going to survive long-term. If it does not open for a year, it is probably never going to open again, or it will open and immediately fail. What does it take to get a community to, to reopen its businesses? You need to be able to have that flexibility and the adaptability of uh, having it only open for a couple of hours, or running things on the honor system for a while, or shopping local instead of doing everything order in from somewhere else. That it's all of these sorts of, of ways of caring about each other that will make a community survive. When we talk about small towns that are being abandoned, that when we have problems, not such a small town, but uh, Detroit is having large problems with population loss, that these are indicators that the community resilience is fading, that there's less sense of collective, it is us against the world, that is splintering and there's less caring for each other's neighbors on a very immediate basis. So, we've now established it's a really, really good idea to get to know your neighbors. How do you do that? What does that look like? What can you do to increase your community resilience in a very selfish manner that means you're all going to live? So chat first, talk to each other, get some ideas flowing.
All right, you guys are on the hot seat first this time. What can you do to increase your community resilience? Block parties. Block parties. Yeah, the, the title of the talk was a good hint on this, hey? All right, so if we're going to have a party, what sort of things do we need to have happening at that party for it to be good for community resilience? Or other ideas for this? Name tags. Name tags. Know who each other are. And if we want to be like really high end on our name tags, I'll teach you a tip I learned as a science lobbyist, because somebody has to lobby on behalf of science, which is when we shake hands, our eyes follow the path of motion. Therefore, have your name tag right up on that side. People see your name more often. When they see your name more often, you build more trust. They're more likely to believe you. Lobbyist tricks. Like that's your like basic, very practical pro tip right there. Other ideas? Yeah, saying hello, starting that conversation. So talking to your neighbors about what they can do, what their strengths are, also what their limitations are, what their weaknesses are. Yeah? So opening conversations when you're going to change your property, chopping down a tree or doing anything like that. I live on the coasts. If you do something to your coastline, say put a wall on one part, you're actually going to impact sediment transfer up and down the beach and impact how erosion happens on other parts of it. So you better talk to each other. Uh, that cutting down trees can change uh, whether or not you've got exposure to wind in particular ways or how water is going to flow or any of those sorts of concepts. Um, building something new can increase how much load there is on a slope and change its landslide susceptibility. So this is both talk to your neighbors and also talk to geological engineers. Make sure what you're about to do isn't going to cause everyone to have a very miserable day. Yeah. All right, so churches are really big community center activity in everywhere I don't live. Um, religion is not a part of my cultural heritage. I fundamentally don't understand it, um, which it just, it, I, I didn't encounter it. So I, I don't really know how they operate. Um, but what are some other um, community organizations that also have gatherings of that sort? This, well, or just other things, mm, go ahead. Yeah, so town hall meetings, um, school PTA meetings, uh, any sort of street festivals, anything where a community gathers together. It can be for any purpose at all. Hmm? Sorry? Associations. Neighborhood associations. Yeah, block watches, anything like that. Atheist communities. <laughs> Atheist communities. Hey, it's, it's like we have a community here that has a bunch of people who are in geographic pro proximity and are talking about disaster preparedness. Oh, oh, how did that ever happen? <laughs> So, neighborhood welping, welcomings, knock on the door of new neighbors. Hey, I see you moved in here. Nice to meet you. I'd like to survive. <laughs> Other ideas? Common Develop common interests. So doing things in, in hobby activity groups, anything like that. Sharing food. Sharing food. This is like, this is turning into also, how do you make friends as an adult? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. What specific things can you do at a party to enhance having it be also disaster preparedness? And this is where I'm going to flat out admit I am the most cheerful doom person ever. Like flat out, I have no qualms about this. I am a very shy individual at heart, clearly. Um, I'm a very shy individual at heart, but one of my very big driving fo forces is I'd like to survive and I live in disaster areas. So I knock on my neighbor's door and literally go like, hi, my name is Mika. I understand building community resilience will help us all survive. So I'd like you to come to my place this week. I'm hosting a party of the neighbors. And when people come over, I go, great, welcome to my home. I live here, these other people live here. I have a hedgehog, he lives over here. Hey, how about you take off your coat and get comfy? Oh, I have a tiny little apartment, you'll have to put your coat on my bed. I spend a third of my life there. If the building collapses, please dig for me here first. <laughs> you can actually be that blunt. Be like, hey, so in case of tornado, here is my safe space. If you happen to need it, you're welcome to come here in terms of like disasters, we've got the sirens going and your safe space isn't okay, come join me. Oh, my building collapsed, dig here first. Right? Like, why not be open about it? Collect each other's phone numbers. 
Okay, so phone numbers can get a little bit creepy if you're doing it in some circumstances. Consent is a very big issue, and it's very easy for people to start abusing things in here. So, talking about an emergency preparedness context, building up social capital. Social capital is trust. So in this room right now, I can pretty much say that everybody here, she's got the most social capital, because she runs this for years and has built up trust and honesty where we go, oh, she's taking care of us, she knows what's going on, right? Who in your neighborhood has the most social capital? How can you build your social capital? What sort of things do you do? You effectively put like, good karma in the bank and wait for it to pay off later. This is a community resilience thing. This is also like relationship counseling 101, which is um, the data on relationships is you can respond to somebody's bid for attention by either turning towards them. Oh, you want to talk to me about my day or you've asked me to ask you about your day. I'll respond in a positive manner. You can turn away from them of screw you. I'm not answering. Or you can be neutral and just be like, Neh. yeah, you want to talk? No. Not happening. The more of those positive interactions you have, the more you build up long-term uh, trust and goodwill, and it means that when things go badly, you've got a bigger bank to draw on. Works in relationships, works in communities. So when you participate, when you get out there and you do things, when people get to know you, when you show up and volunteer at the library doing community reading hours, when you host parties, invite people over, when you organize the community block party for everyone to get to know each other, even if it's just to like play soccer in the street, or I don't know what the local sport here would be for that. Uh, I'm in America. Baseball? I'm very bad at American. <laughs> I like street hockey and soccer. What else do you play? And so any of those sorts of things are all ways to build up your social capital. And you can be really direct and blunt about it. Like, that's actually a really easy way to get over the social awkwardness. Because otherwise, like, introducing yourself to your neighbors, particularly if you've been there a really long time, can be like, I should know your name by now, but I don't. Oopsies. Or I've been living next door to you for 10 years and I've never bothered to say hello. <laughs> this can be a way of breaking through that, of being like, so I just learned about community resilience and I realized that we as a neighborhood have a lot of things we can do to prepare. Here are some of our local disasters. Let's talk about them and how we can prepare as a group. What sort of things can we do? How can we do like a group training together or bring in the fire department to teach us about how to access uh, the, the water mains or any of those sorts of conversations? You can start with that as your opener, and then suddenly all the, like, the friendship bits kind of slide in along the sides once you've given a structure for it to happen. All right, any sorts of ideas of things we can do specifically to be like, this is a disaster preparedness party? <laughs> all right, so do a disaster preparedness party in the dark. <laughs> I like that, actually. So that, first of all, you have to figure out where your, your uh, emergency power off is and how to turn it back on and like do your flashlights work. And you can also do the, like, do we have our batteries charged? <laughs> what other things can we do? Like doing a murder mystery party and cutting the power part way through? Oh, that would be super fun. You'd also have to find like medical kits. Do a zombie apocalypse party. Yeah. Have to find like water and first aid supplies stashed around the house. All right, so this is a question of being open to other people talking to you. So if you've got neighbors who are trying to reach out to you, being receptive to that. And it's okay to set boundaries. It's okay to be like, you can't call me every Friday night. I got plans. But being open to the idea of getting to know them at least a little bit. They can be acquaintances. That's fine. Other ideas? Yeah, so working in conjunction with a neighborhood crime watch or an emergency response team or any of those sorts of things. Um, so again, we talked earlier a little bit about spontaneous volunteering. So this is when there's a disaster, everybody wants to come help. It's the Mr. Rogers phenomena, right? Like the world is full of terrible things, look for the helpers. You will always find helpers, right? We very commonly have so many people donating supplies after disaster that we end up with like a giant logistical mess and we're like, we have too much junk. Could you just give us money to spend how we need it instead? So donate money if you can, <laughs> instead of goods. Um, but donating time, if you're near a disaster uh, that's happening, one of the, the very basic tasks you can do is called registration and referral. And it's doing the form filling out in great deal of detail. And if you go and get trained on this first, 
then you can be one of the people who's training the others. That it does not take, it takes like an hour of training to get certified for doing this. Um, or any sort of, find out what it is that your community needs in terms of very basic emergency response training. I get CPR certified, or even let your CPR certification lapse after you've done it for the first while, that's okay. Remember to sing Staying Alive, that will give you the best rhythm for being able to, to keep it going. This is Staying Alive, Staying Alive, it's the right BPMs, it's great. Um, very convenient. Yeah, why not? Basic survival tips. Uh, you can carry, I have a little tiny CPR mask in my bag. It's very useful as well, just in terms of it's small things. All right, so why were we talking about all of this in the first place? Well, for, partly it's, I'd like you all to survive. But now, just by talking about things, you now have a couple ideas of plans. You've got a little bit of like things that you might go talk to the people you live with or the people you live near about. And that, by itself, will increase your odds of survival. And now that you've done that one tiny step, the next step is easier, and the next is easier, and the next is easier. You don't need to do all your preparedness in one go. It's just fine to be incremental about it, that anything is better than nothing, all right? So even tiny little bits will get you going. So I've got nine minutes left in my time slot, and I'm sure the next person needs a tiny little bit of, of setup time. So here is my question for you. Do you have any other questions, ideas, plans? What do you want to do going forward that we should talk about before we leave today? Yeah? Yeah, so the Red Cross does a lot of training. Um, a couple other organizations also do, uh, there's even one out in the hallway over there that says something about disaster training. I haven't talked to them very much yet. There's a lot of different organizations that will do training. Uh, the SPCA will do training, or the Humane Society, whatever you've got in your particular community. You can do it very targeted. You can be like, hey, I want to, like, I only want to work with the animals because people are terrible. That's okay. That's fine. There's an entire, like, Red Rover is an amazing pet response organization in the U.S. because pets aren't technically covered by a whole lot of emergency preparedness stuff yet. <laughs> All right, so go camping a few times. Learn to cook outdoors. Um, I'd also like to give you the tip on how to have a toilet when you don't have any uh, plumbing going on. So having garbage bags and lye will really, really help in terms of keeping the stink down and the hygiene happy. Yes, please, please, please pressure your politicians to actually deal with disasters in advance of the disasters. So uh, I think Samantha is talking, I don't know what time slot she's in, but she's talking about how um, natural disasters is kind of a terrible terminology because stuff is going to happen anywhere, but we only care about it if people or objects are at risk. We can have all the landslides we want on Mars, but if there's no rover there, we don't care. There's been a hurricane going on on Jupiter for several centuries. Ain't no thang. We only care because people or property is at risk. And that pretty much means that we are doing this all to ourselves. Like talking to your politicians about how do you mitigate in advance? How do you say, stop building everything right on the floodplain and have that be parks or agricultural land instead would really, really solve a lot of our issues. <laughs> or how to have setbacks, fire breaks inside your, your city planning, how to, say, not build the hospital at the bottom of the landslide. That's my personal quest. Can we stop putting hospitals and schools at the bottom of giant looming landslides that are going to come down eventually? Just put a warehouse there. People are only in warehouses, like a couple of people for a couple hours a day. We can bury the, the objects just fine. Um, and that disasters agencies tend not to be funded until the disaster has already happened which is one of those like, really? That's unfortunate. Okay. Yes, so there are types of warning systems, all sorts of warning systems. So you've got the tornado warning systems here, the hurricanes happen, they get nice days and days in advance. Earthquakes, we can get a couple of seconds warning time. In California right now, they're doing a beta of, of the earthquake warning system, and they just need to cough up about $3 per resident in California. So everyone just needs to donate a cup of coffee, and they could actually roll it out as a fully operational system. Um, in what I talked a little bit earlier about how uh, the US has not hardened its power grid against flares, the amount of money it would take to actually harden our power grid so that we could handle having a giant electromagnetic storm and actually recover from it is the cost of a 30-second Super Bowl commercial. So in the scale of the US budget, freaking nothing. Uh, and all it takes is the political will to actually do that. 
uh, letting your emergency, your local politicians know, your state politicians, your representatives all the way up, nag your reps. Their job is to take care of you, make sure they understand how and what you want them to do. All right, so in summary, <laughs> in summary of what it is that we're doing today. So disasters happen everywhere. There is nowhere safe on this planet, but the different types of disasters will happen in different locations. You can learn about your disasters by going to local universities, asking science organizations, finding out about your local emergency management. All of these things will help you understand what your disasters are. Don't try and prepare for everything. Pick which ones are actually more likely to happen to you or have a bigger impact on you. Humans have a bit of cognitive dissonance on this as well. We're really bad at high intensity, low frequency events. Everyone will win the lottery and the big earthquake will not happen in my lifetime. Be aware of that about yourself. You've got the logical and uh, rational reasoning to be able to overcome that particular quirk of human psychology. Try and make plans, have some sort of idea of what you want to do, have some sort of idea of what sort of supplies would make your life easier in case of a disaster and then talk to your neighbors, start getting to know them, build up that community resilience, and help each other out. Practice on the small events, the power outages, the fires, the heat waves, the cold streaks, anything like that. And if you keep practicing on those smaller events, you're gonna be big, better prepared for the larger catastrophes. I hope you never have a large catastrophe, but should one happen, I would really appreciate it if you all lived. That would be my personal ambition. Education is the number one way to be able to prepare against disasters. Understanding how and what they are will allow you to respond appropriately, stop, drop, and roll, or drop, cover, and hold on, or understanding if you're in a coastal area and the water goes out, your correct response is run, not investigate. Uh, this has saved, this saved an, uh, 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 British schoolgirl managed to save an entire hotel of people in Sumatra during that tsunami. Just based on that, she fought the entire hotel and was like, you are all going to the roof now uh, and save them all. So good job, education. <laughs> if you have questions about disasters, please feel free to speak with me. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as Mika McKinnon. I have a unique enough name. You can also find me like freaking everywhere else on that same name. I'm really easy to stalk. Um, please don't actually stalk me, though. I have enough of that already. <laughs> like I've met my quota. Um, and if you just want other things to chat with me about, I also work in sci-fi, uh, particularly uh, working with either space or disasters. It is a really excellent form of disaster communication, and I can defend, like, freaking even Sharknado. I may or may not have worked on Sharknado. I don't know. Um, but I could defend Sharknado as a useful form of disaster education. So if you just need an excuse, come chat with me about your favorite fiction, and we'll talk about the science in it. All right, that's it for me. I'll clear the stage for everyone else. Thank you.